Amen. So we've been doing a series called Reigning in Life. Amen. And, you know, we're going to call this one this morning, if you're taking notes. Of course, some of you already know to ask for notes. Good for you. Because it's not your notes. Those are my notes. So at least you know the body of what we're teaching. All right? So we're going to call this, now listen carefully, our king, his kingdom, and offices. Our king, King Jesus, his kingdom, and offices. How many here know that when you went to school, there was a principal's office? But how many know the principal was different than the office? Look up at me. Sure. You had to go through the door of the office to get to the principal. And you know, on your way there, I think it's called the road of repentance. Carrie, come to the office. How many ever felt that way? I've been called to the office several times. You know, thank God. You know what? God is calling all of his children worldwide to come to his office. Come on, I want you to pay attention. He's calling all of his children to come pray. Now, many, many are doing that because you can hear it all over. Different places, fires going on in colleges, people seeking God and going after God. Now, the media is not going to tell us that. We need to get that by God. He needs to download that to us and encourage us. Now, I remember the prophet Elijah was really discouraged because he thought he was the only righteous man in the world left. And God says, hey, wake up, young man. You got your eyes on the physical. Put your eyes on me. There are many thousands more just like you. And so oftentimes we can get tunnel vision. So what I'm saying to you, in this little lesson, I want you to know that we're going to talk about uh, many wonderful things about God's kingdom. But we're going to stay about the kingdom for a little bit of, of time because you and I dwell in the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? Say, all right, let me give you a little piece of what I'm talking about. You might not know this, and some people will maybe kind of argue this, but let me give you the beauty of this. In the beginning, God was. God is, always will be. And he had a kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. And it was called the kingdom of God. Okay? That means everything that God created and did and did for his glory all was within the kingdom of God. Say amen. Now, there's two problems with understanding this. Is there are two branches that broke away from this kingdom of God. Okay, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, when Moses went up into the mountain to seek after God, what did he see? He saw a bush that was burning, but not consumed. A holy bush, didn't he? And I asked the Lord about that. I said, what is that? And he says, that is the picture of me and my kingdom. Everything is on fire and alive. And Moses couldn't handle it because Moses already was under Adam's curse. Remember, and he couldn't, no one can get in the presence of God. Remember, in the Old Testament, follow me now. And so Moses said, well, I can't handle it, you know. Take your shoes off his holy ground. So Moses saw a vision of the original kingdom of God. Say amen. Now, two broke off. First of all, Lucifer became prideful, became lustful, and he broke away from God and became darkness, and he is the author of sin. That's why to have sin in your life means the nature of Satan's working and making you do wrong things. So we were born alive but in a body of sin. So then when you got the age of accountability, knowing right from wrong, mischief took over in your heart and you fell away from God and have to become born again. Let's go back to the kingdom. So God had lost not only Lucifer and his gang, but now they're his enemy, but they went in and they stole Adam away from God and caused him to sin, and another branch broke off. Two branches, Lucifer, which is no redemption for him and his group, and mankind fell away in Adam. Now, who's Jesus? Jesus is our Savior. He's called the last Adam. He came and he brought a means and he paid the price 
to graft us, the broken branches away from God's kingdom, grafted us through Christ back into the vine. Say amen. What vine? That fiery vine that Moses saw in the beginning? That's God's kingdom. Can you say amen? And you and I being born again, we dwell in that fiery bush. So now you know God thinks the world of you. And because you've accepted his son, he treats you as if you are his. Everyone say, thank you, Father. Now, I'm not done with it yet. So mankind, the earth, everything fell away from God's kingdom of God. So Jesus came, died, paid the price for us to go back, and then sent the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven. Everyone say kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a piece of the kingdom of God. It's a piece with everything the kingdom of God has. The kingdom of God might have a million soldiers, but the kingdom of heaven only has 10 of those. So you have everything that God is. So when the whole, Jesus rose from the dead, I'm trying to tell you this story so you get a picture of it. Rose from the dead, he instilled the ability for the kingdom of God to come and the Holy Spirit come to teach us how to walk in the kingdom. That's why as Christians, you want to avoid being religious and learn to walk with Jesus on a daily basis. Someone say amen. So the kingdom of heaven is a piece of the original kingdom of God. So let's say you have a dozen eggs, say amen, and you pull one egg out, okay? The dozen egg represents the kingdom of God, the big thing, and the one egg represents a piece of the kingdom of God, which is a part of the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? Okay, it's not the whole thing, but it's a part of the complete package, so you have, and it's important I lay this out, you have an invisible kingdom that Jesus bought and paid for operating that you cannot see. It's filled with angels. And Joanna, there's twice as many angels than the enemy has demons. But the problem is we were conditioned to be negative. So we don't see a lot of positive encouragement. Hello, someone say, oh, me. So don't you be negative. Don't be, hold on, why? Because you're born again. You've got God living on the inside of you. Look up, focus on Jesus. Why? So he can fill you with hope and encourage your faith. Say amen. So you got the picture? You have the kingdom of heaven. Now listen, the kingdom of heaven is being downloaded I'm wearing jeans today, and they're kind of baggy. The kingdom of heaven has been downloaded in your heart as well. Can you tell me how God is getting and building the kingdom of God in your heart? By his word. Not by your thinking or reasoning, but by getting the word of God inside of you. Because the word is a seed. What happens to a seed? Now, Linda knows this. If you take a seed... If it's a healthy seed and you put it in the ground, water it, what happens? The seed just automatically grows. This is what God is trying to tell you. Listen, make note of what I'm about to tell you. I just want to be your friend and tell you this. God is in your heart like a seed. And as you read and get in the word of God, even though if you don't really much understand it, but you're getting some seed in you. Just kick back, get involved with God. Don't get so caught up in all the wipes affairs. And all of a sudden, that seed will start germinating and growing. So let's say you need healing. So you begin to pull out of the word of God the healing scriptures. Quote them out loud so the seed goes into your heart. Then just begin to meditate and get your mind off yourself because the enemy says, oh, you got an owie. No, see if anything's different. He's always got us focusing on us. See if anything changes. No, get your eyes on God. Pretty soon you'll change and don't even know it. So if you put the healing seed in you, you water it and just get caught up with God, guess what's going to come? Healing. Gosh, you guys are so sheepy. The devil stole the word right out of you. Now listen, healing will come, 
but it won't come overnight. It has to germinate, it has to grow. So what do you do to get it to grow fast? You wee, you put some miracle grow on there by getting in the presence of God. Next thing you know, you get healed. I can tell you time and time again where I laid hands on myself, believed I received my healing, and then the devil says, look, see if it's any different. And I says, no, I'm not going to look. I don't care less if I feel or it looks any different up by stripes, I am healed. Now the seed is down there, you see. And as we walk with God, it's starting to germinate. Who's the seed? Everyone say Jesus. Who's the word? Everyone say Jesus. You see, so you are so well blessed. But you see, the enemy is just a trick. He sows weeds in your fields. He gets your mind to be somewhere else, gets you over-concerned. And you know what? Then you'll begin to speak it. And then you'll start planting wrong seeds. Now, folks, you don't want to be planting wrong seeds because you know what wrong seeds do, Joanna? They grow. So you need to shut down the wrong seed planter. So stop talking about everybody's problem and how limited you are. You're smarter than you think you are. Start speaking up. Say amen. Who lives in you? Who dwells in you? Who's given you his spirit? Who's given you his armor? Who's given you his word? What are you doing with it? And it's our ability to relate with God is how we grow or not grow. Say amen. All right, you ready? Let's read our scriptures. All right, so our king, his kingdom, and offices. All right, let me know if it's up. Okay, Hebrews chapter 1, listen to this very carefully. Because in the Bible, you have two testaments, an Old Testament, a New Testament. And the old contract is fulfilled. Now you have a new contract. Can you say amen? Don't throw the old one away because you can look at all the flaws and the different things that went wrong and learn from their mistakes. But don't try to practice an old covenant because you'll fall from the new one. And it's like saying, Jesus, what you did for us is not good enough. I'm going to go back in the Old Testament, wave some flags and call you Yahweh and all that old wild stuff, which is frankly boring to God because he gave us Jesus. Now, please, I'm not putting down anyone that does that. They're just ignorant. They mean well. You can mean well, but be wrong. Let's move right along. Okay, here we go. God, okay, who in various times, talking about times past, in various ways used different people, different spokesmen, spoken times past to the fathers by who? The prophets. God revealed it first to the prophets so they could speak it to the people so they could hear the word. We have it written. Can you say amen? But listen to what he says in verse 2. But has in these days, what days? These last days spoken to us by his son. Everyone say Jesus lives in me. He's my mouthpiece. He's my example. He's who I follow. Now, see, this is the problem because all of us get eager. We feel like we're in a hurry. When we need to be there early, everything in the world pops up and our flesh begins to react and start to go through the motion. No, Jesus sitting on the throne of your heart, let him take control. Hello. You'll be healthier, happier, and a, a lot less crabbier. Move on and laugh, everybody. Okay, so look at and it says, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Who is heir of all good things? Jesus. Now here, Jesus died, paid our price, got the world back, sits at the right hand of the Father, and he has the heir of all things. And the Bible says if we are Christ, then we are heirs, joint heirs with Christ. Everything that Jesus has, we have to. We have the king. We have his kingdom. We have and operate within his offices. Oh, man, that's exciting. It's exciting. And it goes on, describes Jesus, also a description of what we're supposed to be. And it says, appointed to be heir of all things, whom he also made the worlds. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, the Father's person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Your life is held together by the word of God and God in you. So please, don't do things a lot your way. Go back to God and say, God, let's do it our way together as a team. Do something like that. 
because my old habits got me where I was, and that was to my knees until I received Jesus. Now, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, including our lives, when he had by himself purged our sins, stripped them all away, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the what? Now, if you read the first two chapters, who wanted this world? Satan did, didn't he? And you'll see in the first two chapters of Hebrews that God says, I didn't give the world to angels, but I gave it to my son. I gave it to mankind. I didn't give it to angels. What is he talking? He's talking about how Satan still wants to steal this planet. He wants to take your children, steal this planet. So, hey, Bunky, get the armor on, walk with Jesus, and he'll keep them safe. At least safer, say amen, because you really can't dictate to what your children or grandchildren are going to do. You just pray over them so they make right choices. Say amen. All right, moving along, look. And it, he says, having become so much better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then Matthew 28, 18, I love this. When it says all here, this one here means all. Can you say amen? Because it's all pertaining to, but this one means all authority. Listen what it says. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority. How much? All so where's the devil getting his? All authority has been given to me in heaven and in. So guess what? When you and I stand up in Jesus, having done all to stand, when you and I walk with Jesus, Satan has to go to, through Jesus to get to us. But when you and I stand up, we live for Jesus, and we just go ahead and do our thing, hoping God's going to bless us, then guess what? The enemy will be able to tempt us and test us because we're stepping out of line, out ahead of Jesus where we can be shot at. Little arrows come flying through things. So learn to get the rhythm of God. Learn to stay within the kingdom. I mean, there's a lot of room there. <laughs> a lot of good things there. But we don't, dwell, we don't know how to dwell. Have you ever watched people? They don't know how to sit still. We need to sit still and know he's God, to be still and understand his fullness. Then we can be confidently full of faith to dwell in the kingdom of heaven. Say amen. amen. All right. Okay. All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Then he tells them, you go. You go in my name. So, folks, here's another encouragement for you. When you say the name of Jesus, everyone say Jesus. Let's do it again. Jesus, literally, you're enacting the covenant, which means that God, his ears are all open. All of heaven, all the kingdom of heaven in the earth is open to those who speak Jesus. And then if you begin to walk with Jesus as God helps you, great fever and great dominion things begin to operate in you. Why? Because you're operating within the authority of Jesus. Now, remember this last point, and then we'll get into our lesson. That is, every time you hear the word kingdom, it means dominion, jurisdiction, influence, power. Okay? So, if it says God's kingdom, dominion, power, jurisdiction, influence, power, you see? Amen. Amen. So Satan thinks he owns the world. So here we come in Jesus' name. When we come in Jesus' name, we bring with us the kingdom, the dominion, the jurisdiction of God. Say amen. amen. Jesus said, when you go out two by two, when you enter a house, say, God's peace and power be to this house. And if it's received, dwell there. And if it's not received, kick the dust off your feet. Let it be a judgment to them and move on. The idea behind that is you're bringing good news of the kingdom and you're establishing God's authority in the will of man. If nobody shares with mankind the good news of the gospel, how can they know to be saved? And this is why Satan has skewed the message. Judgment in America, we're going to get out everybody's up in arms and they, they're mellowing now because they're praying. But you've seen how a couple of years back everybody was so up 
That's Satan's feeding ground, his feeding ground. Let's get you upset so he can feed off of you like a bloodsucker. Jesus says, walk in love, have the peace of God, say amen. All right, we're going to cover these four areas. Everyone say, phew, that was a sermon right there. All right, these four areas today. Number one, the king and his kingdom. We're going to discuss that. Two, holy is the office and the person in it. We're going to talk about the offices of God, which office every one of you has. Did you know you're in a holy office? How clean is it? Three, the balance between the person and the office. And then fourthly, go and share the gospel, good news of Jesus Christ. All right, let's get into this. Go with me, the king and the kingdom. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 17. And it says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is Linda and I prayer for you guys too, the Father of Glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revealing a revelation in the knowledge of him, the knowledge of Jesus. You grow a little bit at a time. That the eyes of your understanding becoming enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Now listen, you have all of this in the saints, And what is the exceeding greatness? Everyone say, exceeding greatness. That's just not greatness. That's exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. How many believers are out there? According to the working of his mighty power. Now listen, verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And seated him at his own right hand. Jesus sits at the right hand fully in charge. Now you might ask. If Jesus is fully in charge, then how come the world is so out of order? Because everybody in the world has to surrender to the one who's fully in charge. For the fully in charge to take over their life. If you're just going to wonder and operate like most human beings do, off of people and news and try to get their life to work, you're going to wear yourself out and often will turn to other alternatives to try to get by. But now that we have turned to Christ, our wisdom is from above. God wants our eyes of our understanding enlightened. That we may know what the will of God is, how to walk with him, say amen. Amen. And what the inheritance, inheritance we have as believers. Then it goes on verse 21. It says that Jesus Christ is far above principality. That's called the devil's kingdom. And power, Satan's authorities, and might and dominion. And every name that's named, not only in this age, but also which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet. Now, the feet are not in the head. The head's Jesus. The feet are in the what? The body. So who's the body? You are. So you have the authority of the kingdom, but you've got to learn to use it. And so what does Satan do? He comes in right away, gives you religion. Well, you never know, Sherry, what God's going to do. Well, I, I tell you, I had a terrific, horrible week, but I know God's trying to tell me something. That is not the gospel. That is confusion and religion. Do not buy into that. And I'll sell you the Golden Gate Bridge. That's religion. That's a tired spirit that's giving up. Get up. You're not dead yet. Say amen. All right, so let's go on. He says, and put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. And then go with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. And I'm just trying to show you the authority of our king. And look at what Philippians says, verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name. See, God wants you to pay attention to the name of Jesus. Now, listen, I'm going to say some things kind of irritate you. But he doesn't want you to go, Father, I come to you in the name of Yahweh. He didn't say to do that, did he? Now, if you're German, you would say Jesus in German. 
If you're Hispanic, I can do that. Jesus. But it's never changed from Jesus to another name. So what has the devil done? He's got everybody so mixed up. They're practicing Old Testament principles. They're speaking all these names. And then they're going to classes being amazed to learn Hebrew. Now listen, that's wonderful. Except for when you find out that the Hebrew they're learning is a renewed Hebrew, not the original. And that people, different people, we call them, uh, what are they called? They're called rabbis. Don't agree with anybody. So if you get some rabbi teach you their Hebrew, you go over to fellowship the Hebrew of another one, you're already in division. This is Old Testament star. And people are going after that. And Satan says, go ahead, man. Just go ahead and get lost in the facts and the figures and forget about Jesus. Hope you got that. And that's what's been going on for 20 years. Listen, I warned the fellow down the street. I said, don't go out and teach Jewish traditions and how wonderful it is. They're wonderful. That comes after a Christian knows Jesus and builds a friendship with him. And what they'll do is people always want a mystery. They always want something to look after. What does Satan do? He dangles the mysteries. Jesus speaks to you because you're sons and daughters of God. He doesn't dangle mysteries in front of you. Say amen, somebody. So therefore, God has highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow. Now listen, where? Of those things in heaven, those on earth, and now listen, this next phrase, and those under the earth. The snake lives under the earth. He's got a whole group of, I don't know what they're called. They're demons, but they manifest differently. Oh, the Indians for thousands of years will tell you about these ant people. Well, we're going to that sometime at lunch. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I believe every name for God is honorable and beautiful. Many of the names for God are God's man's name for God of what his mighty works and stuff. God, only a few places, ever named himself. And one place he named himself and points to the name he wants us to pay attention to. What be that name, everyone? What be that name? Speak it louder so you kick Satan's teeth in. Jesus! Never be quiet about Jesus. What that, what's that name? Jesus. There you go. You see, you don't understand, it's a weapon. It's a weapon. Every time you say, oh, I'm in love with Jesus, you just smack Satan back. Get this in you. Why? You're advancing a kingdom. His kingdom has already been broken. Now we're taking over. When you're taking over, you say, please, may I rebuke you, Mr. Devil? Please, may I take over my family back that you've been ruining their lives, Mr. Devil? And that's how we've been as Christians. That's what Satan has done to the church. And you're not that way. Say, I'm not that way. Tell somebody next to you, say, I am not that way. So point one underneath this is church, Jesus Christ sits the right hand of God, the Father, fully in charge under the Father's authority. We have to surrender to him and get that authority operating, and you have. Two, the devil was stripped at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the earth and all its fullness belongs back to our Savior and King. That's why we go to him. We reign with him. We get to get to know him. Thirdly, we also accepted, when we accepted Jesus in our hearts, we have been given full authority. As as many as received him, to them he gave authority for them to be children of God. John 1, 12. And then, fourthly, mankind was given this earth... We lost it to the, the serpent. Jesus came, got it back, and then purchased us. But we have to join with him in order to get off this planet. Just because Jesus bought every human being's life doesn't mean every human being's going to turn that life over to him. And listen, some of us, think about it. And the less you do this is better. Don't resist what God wants to do in your life because you know it's always good. Because if the devil can convince you that sometimes God drags you through the mud, puts you in the crud, and who never knows about the flood? 
You know, if you think that God is that way, then you'll never open up and never be close to him. God is not that way at all. And the closer you get to him, the more you know what he's like. You can feel his beauty. God is always a giver. He never stops giving. So, well, what if I make a man? Will he stop giving? No. He'll give you forgiveness. He never stops giving. We have to get a picture of it because the world can't paint a picture of that. God is too beyond mankind. Now, many of us had good fathers, good sisters, brothers, been kind to us, but not like the father. Have you experienced something sweet every day as you get with him? Come on, tell somebody. We have to testify. Oh, sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between the Lord and I. I've fallen in love with him over and over and over and over again. Amen? Let's do it again. No, let's not. All right. Last scripture I want to give to you, and I want to kind of emphasize it on this first point. Matthew 28 again. We read this to you, but now we're going to cover it a little farther. And Jesus came to him, spoke to his disciples and all of us, saying, all authority has been given to me both in heaven and earth. Didn't he say when you pray, be it done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, now go therefore and make students. The word disciple means make somebody that's a student of the word that knows their God. Okay. Make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What is this baptism? Salvation. You got to get somebody to confess Jesus and their sins and bring Jesus in their heart in order for them to be saved. They can be the best, sweetest person in the world. But because of the sin in their flesh, without asking Jesus in, there's no ticket to heaven. So make sure you tell everybody in order for them to get off the planet, to be forgiven and to be loved of God and adopted by God. They have to say, Jesus, I surrender. Forgive me my sins and come into my heart. Do you think you can memorize that? Huh? You think you can have that memorized? Because then you can start leading your, your, your uh, neighbors to the Lord. Repeat after me. You say, would you like to have Jesus? Oh, I would. Repeat after me. Don't let him have a chance to bow out of it. I'm still waiting for Adam. Has anybody called him? He really wants to come. Just a little coaxing, maybe. All right. So he says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, all authority in heaven and earth given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples to all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Get them born again. Teaching them. Instructing them. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, there's only two commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as I have loved you. The Old Testament, as you love yourself, is out. As I have loved you. Jesus gave us the prime love. Say amen. If you keep those commandments, and all the law and every of the commandments, all the nature of God's fulfilled in you by loving God and loving others. If you don't believe me, read 1st, 3rd, 2nd, and 3rd John. Are you still with me? Then he goes on. Then he says, uh, and teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the age of the earth. And Danny just said, that's why Jesus never flew. He's low with us. He's not, never mind. All right, so amen. Let's go to point two. Point two is, how is holy is the office and the person in it? Okay, so I want to I want to discuss this. First of all, I told my class on Wednesday, learn the word anathema. Everyone say anathema. That means that which belongs to God is holy. Don't touch it. Hello. That means, anathema means, that if something's God's, don't you reach in and start making your way at it. Hello. So let's look at somebody. Let's say, pastor so-and-so. Whose property is he? Come on, you. Don't be wimpy. God's property. So what if he does something wrong? Should we attack him, criticize him? Absolutely not. 
Why? Because whose property is he? So who's going to deal with a man that does wrong? There you go. You're take, when you start criticizing and start doing that, you're taking God away from being his father. And number one, for him straightening out his mess. You're strengthening the enemy. And not only that, you're bringing a curse on yourself. Why? Because God's property is anathema. Hello? Most, most Christians, that, most modern Christians have no clue. If you go back to the Old Testament during Jericho, after God leveled Jericho, he said, all the spoils, all the riches in Jericho are anathema. They all belong to me. If anybody takes anything, you're going to receive a curse. So everyone say, I understand now what anathema is. In the New Testament, it's worse. Okay? Why? Because when a person gets born again, they belong to God. God dwells in them. Right? So if we see somebody doing wrong and we just start criticizing... We're going to have to get through the office to get to them. Are you with me? Hello? Now, you might see somebody in the office messing around, but you're going to have to go through the holy office to criticize that person. Now, who does that person belong to? Let God deal with it. You say, Lord, I don't understand what they're doing, but I'm not going to criticize them, nor am I going to attack what belongs to you. Do you get it? Do you get it? How many times you go on YouTube and the inner tube and they, they got somebody like up there making them look like a demon so that you'll get up on and start making comments? Don't ever do that because you're bringing a curse upon you and you're making your life ineffective because you are taking what is God's and you're putting your hands on it. Hello? How many know what God has is holy? Yes. Now listen to me. Everyone point to yourself and say, I belong to God. So don't you attack me either. You see? So there's an automatic protection for a child of God. Let me explain. When somebody's attacked, didn't Jesus say, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for great is the reward. Right? Persecuted. Because people are going to start attacking you for being good, for loving God. But remember, you are God's. This is a great thing. Why? Because when they attack you, God will deal with them. But when you drive up and you stand up and you start justifying yourself, are you behind Jesus or in front of him? There you got it. Don't do that. Fight the Jesus way. Walk the Jesus way. Let me teach you a little more about the Jesus way. Hello. Say amen. Now, holy is the office and the person in it. Now, they might not do the office well. They could be a good pastor or so, so good. I'm going to use the office as a pastor because next week we're going to go into what is a real true pastor and a shepherd and how to love them, protect them, and how he loves his congregation or she. And so the idea behind this is we're going to talk about the office. So remember, to get to the person in the office, you have to go through the office. And the office belongs to God. The person is, belongs to God, too, unless they're not serving God. But still, you have to get through that holy office. So let me suggest to you as a wise master builder, do not criticize other Christians Criticize other ministries, even though you don't agree with them. Don't bring them up. Don't talk about them as a conversation. Why? Because Satan will catch wind of it and legalize to attack you. You will actually open the door and say, come and get me, Bubba. So don't be stupid like a lot of other Christians are and commenting you're getting on there and commenting about this and so-and-so's this and that. Don't even involve in it because it's a last day confusion to keep the church from reviving to keep us from becoming effective. Can you say amen? You're, you're effective. You guys are effective because you know the difference between the confusion and walking with Jesus. All right, Ephesians, we're going to go to verse 4. We're going to look at how holy is the office and the person in it. So, taking about Ephesians 4, look at verse 9. Now this, talking about Jesus, he ascended... But what does it mean? But that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. 
And he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. That's talking about Jesus. And then look at verse 11. How are we doing up there, all right? And he said, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, that's me, and teachers. For the equipping, see, there are the call of the fivefold ministry. Their job is to equip us for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to a unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or mature man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Why? That we should be no longer tossed to and fro like children, by carried about with every wind of new doctrine, by the slight and trickery of men and cunning craftiness where they lie in wait, deceivingly plotting. And then he goes to verse 15. But we have learned to speak the truth in love, haven't we? We may grow up in all things into him who is ahead. You see, the word is seed. It always grows. So what does the devil do? He throws a lot of negative with your positive seeds, and you're speaking positive, negative all day long, and let's just call it all into record and measure how much negative versus the positive you speak, and would you like the crop for that? Hello. How would you like to have all the negative things this week come on you at the end of the week? Then you present yourself to God, say, hope, Lord, let me speak up. Let me talk up. Let me talk faith. Let me encourage. Help me to wash out the nags in me. See, that's where your private prayer time first thing in the morning comes. So you can get that stuff out of you. So you don't choke to death on your own importance. Hello, say amen. Okay. Till we all come to the unity of faith, and that's the problem. Churches need to get along. Say amen. It says, but speak in the truth and love, grow up into all things, even the head of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. See, we're joined and knit together. We're family. Uh, amen. For each joint supplies according to the effect of working in each of us, which every part does its share, causes growth in the body of itself and love. Now, just look it. You guys are growing mightily. Now, let's get some numbers in here. Say amen. And that means you have to go out and invite. Well, what if they go to their church? What if they hate their church and they're just there because grandma said to be there? If you never go to them and say, would you like to come visit my church? You see, we don't invite. And it is a fact that the reason most people don't go to a church because no happy people invite them to theirs. Hello. They either preach at them or the, of the Jehovah Witnesses come in their happy couples and, and they invite you to a, a study. Come on, get out there, fill your church. Say amen. Thank you for the week. Amen. Amen. Amen, Pastor Gary. Amen. 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 All right. A couple of points underneath that. Church Jesus sent his kingdom at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came as well to teach us how to walk and dwell in that kingdom with authority and power. Two, we see that there are five offices he mentions. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I'm going to talk about pastor next week, pastor, teacher. Because frankly, I'll just tell you, there are people that sit in an office as a pastor, but they can't teach. So they're really not a pastor. See, a pastor has to teach and has to teach well because he dwells with his congregation. The evangelist, he's out and about. Apostles out building churches. Prophets are out speaking the word, say amen. And the pastor dwells with the flock. He's a shepherd. Think about that as next week we prepare to look at some things. All right, thirdly, what is the purpose for these five offices? To equip the body of Christ for the work of the ministry. For church, there is only one body. Say amen. So when people get all divided up, smile at them and say, hey, I had a lady over at Safeway. I want her to look at our broadcast. She would so be blessed. She was raised in a religious background where you can't do anything wrong. She has no joy, and yet she loves Jesus. Sometimes all we eat is meat and potatoes, meat and potatoes, meat and potatoes, meat and potatoes, and somebody comes along with something wonderful. And we're afraid. 
Meat and potatoes, meat and potatoes are religion. Locks you into a bondage. You can't live or visit with too many people because you, you, come on, Jesus is far greater in us than the world. Say amen. All right, get past that, Pastor Kerry. Let's go to the third point. The balance between the person and the office. How many know how I have a great responsibility as a pastor and in the office of a pastor? The office is very holy. It's God's. I am a person. I can choose to surrender to God, be trained for my office, or I can choose to just <clears throat> use the name of the office and live the way I want to. Nevertheless, the office, the office itself is holy. Now think about it. Let's say a person in the office doesn't care, does a bad service, makes a whole bunch of mistakes on purpose, is the office any less holy? No. But the person in it's making a mess. Now, who's going to deal with that person? Please, don't you criticize. Why? Because you have to get through the office, and Satan knows that. Once you strike or start criticizing a man in the office or woman in an office, you have to go through the office, and they have to get through God. And whose property is that person? God's. Anathema. Everyone say anathema. I'm going to tell you, in the next year, you're going to see people dropping off dead because they keep attacking the body of Christ. I'm going to, you mark my words, they're going to fall over dead because they're attacking God's holy church. Now, I'm t not telling you that people in the church are perfect. I'm telling you the church, in God's degree, treats it as perfection. So if you strike the church, God will strike you. So there'll be a lot of people who are playing games with God. They're going to drop away. And only the pure motive, pure loving in God are going to come forth. And they're going to shine. And that's what we're going through at this moment. So my next point, find the balance between the person and the office. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Let's pick up at verse 4. You gotta laugh with me. When I worship, I cry a lot, and my, my heart just and I get all this gush going. You ever try to wipe your nose and blow your nose with this kind of microphone on? It is wild off to talk to you over lunch about that. Anyway, so let's go on. So Jeremiah 1, look at verse 4. And I want to just tell you this: every person before you were created, God knew you purpose for you and had nothing but good plan before you. So that when we were born in Adam, if Adam would have never fallen, we would populate the entire universe because we're a God creature. But Satan came in, Adam fell, and now God's locked us on this planet because he doesn't want us out there infecting the universe. Say, oh, I just learned something. That's called quarantine. We're quarantined here, and the only way we can get out is to have our sins forgiven and go through Christ. Now, do you understand the gospel, not religion? It's your ticket way to walk out of here. You find that in John 10. So I want to read along with me. So the word of the Lord came to me. This is Jeremiah the prophet. This is, and he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctify or set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That would be, I ordained you to carry my name into the world, you guys. Take it seriously. Then said I, oh, Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak. For I'm, I, I'm about a youth. How did the guy say it? Youth. You'd. You're a, I'm a youth. For you shall go all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you will speak. This is the same message to us, even though we're not prophets. I'll tell you why in a minute. Hello? Do not be afraid of their faces. For I am with you. In our case, he is in us. To deliver you, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand, and everyone received this, and touched my mouth. 
And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in, my mo- in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. In other words, who's our king? Where does he dwell? In heaven and in our heart? He's given us his kingdom, his spirit. We're to go in his name and authority to root out, pluck up, pull down, plant, and change things. Don't complain about your president. You don't like him? Root him out. Smile up. You have the authority in Jesus' name to root him out. Now, this is the prophet Jeremiah. How many know he says he was a powerful man? But you know what Jesus said? He said the most powerful prophet in the Old Testament can't even be compared to one born-again believer in the new. You have more authority in your little finger if you know how to use it right and walk with God to tear down, root out the devil, and to pluck up, command spirits to leave your children, your, your family. Hello? You know, but the, the devil's got the church being religious. We've got all this great weaponry, Sherry, and we end up shooting each other. You're not like I think you should. Boom, boom, boom. Stupid. Don't get involved in that. You feel somebody shooting at you. Listen, I have a lot of people that criticize me and shoot at me, and I don't know why because I don't shoot at them. But you've got to be smart enough to make sure you're not in the line of fire. Say Amen. All right, so let's go on with this. Are you still with me? So he put his hand, touched your mouth. I set you over all the kingdoms. Why? Because we dwell in the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? We dwell under the king of all authority in heaven and earth. Can you say amen? Now go with me. I want to show you that Paul the apostle was ordained by God and so are you. So don't be thinking, well, Grandma blessed me, sent me to Bible college, and I'm going to be a mighty man of God. No, it's not going to be that way. God has to send you. God has to call you. God has to make you a certain way. And you know, he has. Now our job is to get with our Father, find out who we are, and get after it. Hello? If we never try our hand at anything for God, how are we going to know What's good and what's not. We have to be led of the Spirit. All right, moving around. Galatians 1, look at verse 1. It's great. Paul says, I'm an apostle. Not from men, not any group of men, nor through a man, any one man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So are you. You didn't get born again of any one man. Any group of man made you saved. Thank God Jesus Christ did it himself. Can you say amen? That's who your king is. That's who you live for. That's who you walk with. That who is your friend. Church, every human being was purposed for good, to live and thrive before our heavenly father. You find that in Ephesians 1 verse 5. Ephesians 1 verse 5. My lip got caught on my tongue. Two, he knew us and designed us before we even were born. He made us each perfect in our design. And because of Adam's fall, we became flawed. Thirdly, so these are God's offices of the kingdom. We see an apostle. What is it? A prophet, evangelist. We see a pastor up here and a teacher. Fourthly, people call these offices. Okay. People call to these offices. Man, I'm sorry about that. Are human. Everyone know pastor carries human. How many times have I asked you, please don't put your eyes on me because you're every one time you're going to see me make a mistake. God forbid. I'm not talking about a gross sin, me out at Kelly's bar, you know, getting bombed. No, I'm not talking about any of that, but I might get frustrated. That doesn't mean anything because just look at yourself. You without sin cast the first stone. So we don't do that. But you know that anybody that's human is human. So we don't place our eyes on the human part. 
We pray for that human. We pray that God blesses them and that they're able to fulfill their office. Can you say amen? Many of you are mothers. That's an office. Many of you are fathers. That's an office. Some of you are parents. That's an office. That's why Satan loves to break up families and have others break up families. Why? Because the family is a holy office. Remember, you're God's child. You dwell in God. And people, when they attack you, they have to first go through God. And guess what? Satan gets a double fold. He gets the person that's attacking you back, and he gets you by them bringing a curse or criticism to you. Now, I don't know about you. Sometimes for some people, it's hard to get over a hurt feeling. I've had people hurt my feelings a lot. Now, listen, not no more. I have a rubber feeler. Hello? It bounces back. Rubber feeler are bouncing back to health. Because people will criticize, always pick on. You know, so you don't really listen to the criticism. You listen to what is being said over and over again. So if you hear in a volume of a week, boy, you should be smiling more. Maybe that could be a message through all of that, that you could be smiling more. Pick out the positives. Remember, exposed to good and evil. Pick out the positive through the filter of Jesus Christ and throw away all the bad junk. If I happen to say something to you, where have you been all week? That doesn't mean I'm picking on you. That might mean I really missed you. That's how we look at things. Can you say amen? Saints a master are getting us in the mood and always hearing things negative. Say not me. Let's go on to the next. So you know, if you hear Joel Osteen, you go up there and you see on the YouTube, Joel Osteen, look, he looks like the devil. Don't even get involved. Don't even. Any criticism, the church up the street, the thing up the street, even what I said about the persons down the street, they're in the Old Testament, I was really careful not to criticize them and their offices. I can only criticize what somebody's doing wrong for a moment so that the church doesn't fall into this same doo-doo as they did. Do you know I'm a good shepherd? I don't want you getting in trouble when you don't need to. I don't want you swallowing things that you really shouldn't. Can you say amen? So a pastor is really kind of an overseer. And so I'll bring up things that are dangerous, but but not attack people. Can you say amen? Finally, point four. Everyone say point four. Did I get point three? Yes. Point four, go and share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Go with me to John 14, please. And we'll finish up with this. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Now, where does Jesus dwell? Well, he dwells at the right hand of the Father, but he also dwells in us. So, Here's Jesus. He hasn't stopped. He's still speaking. All of this is still true, but we need to let it take over our thinking and our action. So look what he says. This is awesome. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes, how many believers? Remember I told you about your believer? You have a believer, and if you're not careful, it will believe anything. You want, hello? Just look at yourself when you were younger. Come on, laugh at me. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works, that means the very things you do, that I do, will he do also. He didn't say you might do, if you feel good enough. He says you can do these things. And greater works than these will he do. Because I go to be with my father. Now, there's a lot of heavy truth in there. How can you and I do greater works? Who lives in you? Never forget that. See, when you lay hands on somebody, don't try to get Jesus to heal them. Just release Jesus through your arm. See them healed before you pray. See them healed. Make yourself see them healed so that your valve is open and God can flow out. Then the anointing will flow out and the Jesus anointing will heal them. Now, I'm going to say this to you. It's going to take you back, but you need to wise up. Every time I pray for somebody to be healed, Jesus is always there. Jesus' healing is always there. 
But whether it's received or not, it's up to the person receiving. You see, I don't have a problem getting people healed if I can get them to receive. Hello? Amen. And you'd be surprised how know-it-all all of us are. I know. I know. I know. Listen, there are some of us are paying so much attention about us getting healing, and yet out of the side of your mouth, you're cri criticizing and you're doing stuff. I'm speaking on camera here. That very thing will keep you from that healing manifesting because you're striking anathema. Don't criticize. Even though you're justified in some of the criticism, make sure you don't open anathema, okay? Because you want to be on the side of God not on the side of against God. So, amen. You're not going to be on the devil's side ever. But sometimes we work against God's growing in us by our selfishness and sometimes our ignorance. So make a mark of that and kind of ask God to help you through that. So he says, the works that I do shall you do also and greater works than these. And everyone says, because I have Jesus. So when you pray, release Jesus. When you talk about others, speak Jesus over them blessings. If you haven't got anything good to say about anybody, say, oh, you got a nice smile. Try not to say the other because your mouth has two fountains, sweet and bitter. Shut down the bitter one unless you want to eat a bunch of uh, persimmons. All right, go with me to Mark 16, and this is our last scripture. This is how to take over an area. Mark 16 is Jesus' last words to his disciples, how to go, come and bring the kingdom into an area. Now, Satan still thinks he's in charge of the earth, but he doesn't have any power. He only has deception. And remember the word occult. Everyone say occult. It means simply hidden. Satan hides truth and gives us an alternative. So whenever you advance the kingdom, you have to first do what Jesus says here. So let me explain rather quickly. Encourage you and the anointing God's going to drop on you once I finish this. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. He who is baptized, born again, shall be saved. And he who does not get born again is condemned. And these signs will follow them to believe. Say, that's me. In my name, they will what? If you're going to replace one kingdom, you have to cast the devil out that still thinks. Back in World War II, there were a whole bunch of Japanese, had no communication, didn't know the war was over. They were still shooting at Americans because no one gave them the news. Satan has a lot of strongholds out there, still, and they're still fighting as if he's in Lord in charge. But no, all you have to do is stand up in the name of the king and release the power of God. Can you say amen? So you have to address the devil. Have you got a wayward son, a brother, an uncle that maybe are totally rebellious? Then bind that devil. Cast that devil away from them and forbid it to speak to them and operate in their life. Bind them up, put them behind the curtain like you saw me to do, and then release their angels, bringing them to a saving knowledge and a prayer of salvation. Say amen, say I got it. We're replacing a kingdom of darkness and hiding with a kingdom of light and understanding. Can you say amen? That's why it's not done until Jesus takes us home. You get the good news out there. Everybody you can share with, put some seed in them because the seed will automatically what? Grow. It does not return to God void. Let's go on. Okay. And it says, they cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues. Speaking with new tongues, Jude 20 says, building your most holy faith, praying in your tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. So you pray to build yourself up. You cast away the devil, the resistance. You build yourself up, and they will take up serpents. Now, this is a phrase talking about people who act like the devil. This is not handling serpents in Mississippi. Hello, this is handling people who have devils working in them. You'll be able to handle that. You did never hear it this way before. So when people attack you, you know who's behind. Just handle the devil in prayer. Say amen. If you need more detail, come see me after service. 
Okay, and we'll give you more detail on any of those things. I love you so much to show you. Okay, so go on. And they shall handle the serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, do you know there are people that are devious? I was attempted to be poisoned three times in my life. One by a full-blown witch, which I ate her food and lived just fine, and she ended up dying, not on the spot. Sometime I'll tell you that story about her husband and leading him to the Lord, and she got so ticked, so she had him invite us for dinner, a poisoned pig dinner. Anyway, sometime I'll tell you about that. Sometime a guy brought a cursible in, and he poured a little in my glass when I was fellowshipping, so I switched glasses on him, and boy, whatever it was, he got it. See, God is very, very ahead of the enemy. You just got to listen. Don't be paranoid. Say amen. So if they try to poison you doctrinally by teaching you wrong stuff or physically or, you know, with poisons, it will by no means hurt you. And then what does it say? It says you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall what? Well, that's how you take over an area. You go in, cast out the controlling spirits, you pray in tongues, build yourself up for anointing. You go in, and you're getting Satan's resistance like Paul on Amelitos when the serpents came out of the fire. He just shook them off, and they'll come. You should have seen the serpents we dealt with when we dedicated this place to God. And not all serpents look ugly either. They can come in and be sweet as honey and as dangerous as they can be. So you got to have discernment. Could you say, man, so pastors need discernment. And then it says, if you drink any deadly thing, don't be paranoid. Satan is always trying to get you off. And then finally, what should we do with our hands? BJ, what shall we do with our hands? Lay hands on people. Remember, you don't get them healed. Jesus comes out of your hand, heals them if they're open. So don't... Put your hand on your child's shoulder and says, you know, I sure love you, and release Jesus on them. Perfect timing. Release Jesus on them. That Jesus will do the work. Remember, once you release Jesus, he's a smart bomb. He already knows what to do. He just needs you to release him, focus, speak him. Remember, you and I are preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We are establishing God's authority in the earth by the words of our mouth. If you got something out of this this morning, will you give the Lord a hand clap?